as they investigate, it becomes clear that, you know, many people in this neighborhood either know something about what happened to Avery or think they know something or pretend to know something. So it becomes a very tangled knot trying to figure out. And all the while we're worried about Avery, where the heck is she? Welcome to our latest episode of Book Reporter Talks to our guest today is Cheryl LaPena, and we are going to be talking about her instant New York Times bestseller, Everyone Here is Lying, which is also a book reporter bets on selection. I absolutely love this book, and everybody I've handed this book to has loved it as well. Our book reporter reviewer, Bronwyn Miller, had this to say about it. She draws you in right away, keeps you guessing, and the page is turning, and the pace does not relent to the end. If you're looking to cure a reading slump or craving a riveting read in which you can lose yourself over a weekend, everyone here is lying is for you. And I agree. And I also call Sherry the queen of the one sit read. Once I start reading, I cannot stop. So I stood in the pool and read this book for hours. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, Sherry. So nice to have you here. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Well, you know, the last time we were together, I had some dark chocolate for you that was yes. just in case, like, because I knew you liked dark chocolate. Yes. I just want you to know, I have dark chocolate chips here. I'll oh. have to, like, you know, e eat them in the, as the afternoon goes on. But I yes, know do. we can pretend they're in the same room for inspiration. Okay, so it's there's okay. my okay. I, I had my little, mine's empty. Oh, yours I is had my I had my chocolate chips today already. See, I can pour some for you. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I remember when we were in, when I was in New York and we did this in person and you had the chocolate chips and all. Little chocolate chips all ready to go. I just went and got the Giardellis yeah. last night. I pulled them out of the cabinet. Oh, I said, there we go. My favorite. My favorite. Giardelli They're dark so chocolate. so good. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Now, when I finish these this afternoon, I will be cursing you out. But trust me, every time Enjoy one them. dropped last night, I was like, mm, oh, that's mine. They're so good. Addictive. Enjoy them. Addictive. Yeah, well, they are totally addictive. Let's start by you telling us about the opening of Everyone Here is Lying, which has got this great setup with three characters. Mm -hmm. So the opening of the book, it's really about uh, a man, William Muller. He's a doctor and he's just been dumped by a woman who might be the love of his life. And she's uh, broken it off because they're both married and she doesn't want to be found out. So he's he's a bereft and he goes home to the, his what he thinks is going to be his empty house just to pull himself together. And his nine year old daughter, Avery, is there and she's not supposed to be there. She's been sent home from school for misbehaving at choir. And she was supposed to wait for her older brother to walk her home, but she didn't. She came home. She's not allowed to do that. And when he comes home, he finds her there and he's immediately angry at her because she's not supposed to be there. And. They get into an argument, and to his own surprise, he smacks her really hard and knocks her to the floor. And that's sort of the crux of it. And once that happens, you know, he's shocked, she's shocked, he leaves, he hesitates. And then a short time later, Avery's missing. The brother comes home from school, she can't be found anywhere. The police become involved, and of course, the police immediately look at the parents, as they always do. Mm -hmm. But in this case, we have a daughter who's quite challenging, quite difficult, and not your typical little disappeared girl. She's she is a handful. And we have a dad who has, you know, the family has the secret that there's, you know, a little bit of hitting going on there. They've got stuff to hide. They've got secrets. And I'm looking at that dysfunctional family and the police are looking at that dysfunctional family. But then as they investigate, it becomes clear that, you know, many people in this neighborhood either know something about what happened to Avery or think they know something or pretend to know something. So it becomes a very tangled knot trying to figure out. And all the while we're worried about Avery. Where the heck is she? Right, right. Little Avery. So that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, that's exactly. And she's this challenging child. We know already mm -hmm. she's figured out how to get herself home. She's not supposed to, but she remembers the keys under the mat. Like she doesn't even tell her brother she's going home. She just makes it da 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 da. And from there on, like readers are supposed to like figure out what happened. But Avery, I feel like was this character that was fun to write because you've got this child that you're just sitting there going, what would she do next? And there are kind of yeah. no limits. I feel like on what Avery would do to get her way. Yeah, there are no limits. Like she's she's only nine, and I find nine is an interesting age because that's sort of the age at which I remember being sort of conscious of things. 
of a bigger world. You know, that's what I start. That's when I start having met real memories. And I think that's an age where they're not just little children, but they're certainly not as smart as they think they are. So she, she's very bright, but she's not as bright as she thinks she is. And she she's very perceptive, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that she's just not aware of. So she she gets herself into trouble because she thinks she's smarter and knows more than she does. So she's quite vulnerable in that way. Right. right she's right. pretty savvy. So she was fun to write. Yeah. And I figured that then yeah. we go to the neighborhood, we go house by house. And I was wondering, did you draw a map of so-and-so lives here? They have a child. So and so that you you know how long it's going to take the police to get to that house or what that might be yeah. happening. Because I did have to run block. Yeah. I, when I got about uh, when I got well into the book, I can't remember at what point I had to write, I had to do a map, just a rough map of who lived where on the street, because I had to know who could have seen what at any given time. Right. So right, the best right, friend right. is across the street, and it makes the most sense that the best friend would be across the street or close by. But then I had to, you know, if people call in saying they saw her, then they have to be able to have seen her. So yes, I did have to draw a map. And then people say, yeah. like, I saw her get in a car. Then somebody says, and then you find out that the one child didn't really like her. And you find out all mm. these things that Avery may have been doing or not, according to what mm. people are sending you in a direction of doing. So yeah. for us, as the reader, we're sitting there going, did that child really say that about Avery? Did she really not like her? And what was that incident about? Because we all know incidents when kids are nine are blown way out of proportion. Yeah. And yeah. which car and what did it look like and no one really knows what things look like and I just feel and like what really what really happened in the tree house right you know was right. the ladder up or down right was yeah, this or a lot that? of red herrings in this one and, there, and there's and a, a lot, lot of, of well everyone's lying yeah and everyone and also William is supposed to be at the office so he hasn't come clean at the very beginning that he's not in the office because he's supposed to be there. And if he's not, his wife's going to be, well, then where were you? And why was yeah. you know, this going on? So he can't, he's stuck. He can't give an alibi well. because well, but, he doesn't want to admit that he was with his lover and he's trying to protect her. And, you know, meanwhile, she's terrified that the affair will come, you know, out into the open. And of course, one of the fun things about this is if, if you have someone go missing in your neighborhood or someone's murdered, of course the police are going to find out the secrets of everybody on the street. Exactly. So if you're someone trying to hide an affair and suddenly your lover's child is missing, well, you have a lot to worry about. That's and so I think everybody on that street starts to unravel because they all have something that they're hiding and they're all under the scrutiny of the police officers. So I'm, you know, my advice is if you've got a secret, don't live near someone who's going to have a kid disappear or you know, get murdered. Like that. Well, you know, this book and the block party, which took place in a neighborhood as well, uh, what I was thinking was I kept looking up and down my neighbors and like, what do I really know? Like, I know this about them, but do I not know this about them? And as I was reading yeah. the book, I was thinking like, okay, who would be vulnerable? Who would tell the truth? Who would like say, I don't want to get involved. And we we're thinking like this. So I was doing an event was down the shore and I didn't see somebody in the back of the room. Like she came out to me later. It was my neighbor from up North who has a house down at the beach. And she says, when you were talking about the dog, was that me? And I said, yes, that was you. That was you. <laughs> the dog is like, doesn't behave as he's walking. She says, I knew that was me. But it was interesting because you start thinking about your own, like just the houses right around you that you could see. If you're looking out this window, what could they see or not see? What could people, right. and I think that the police are walking down the street saying, okay, if the car went down, which angle would you have been able to see somebody in the car with her, her getting in with somebody? And and then everybody, all the young men in the neighborhood are all, all these young boys are like, no, it wasn't me. You know, I didn't do this. <laughs> and another interesting thing about this one is this particular street, everybody seems to have garages. Yes. And if you're in a garage with the door closed, you can move a body. Anybody uh, on that street can move a body from a house to a car and come out the garage and not be seen. Right. So that's another, I found that interesting, you know, on yeah. that street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got it on this whole mm -hmm. street. And this, is the garage on the side or on the front of the house that you would even see the car coming out the same way? It's all very, very interesting. <laughs> And you also wrote this multiple points of view because it's like, oh yeah, I'm seeing this. I'm seeing that. As you move to one, one to the other, are there some you're more comfortable with or do you just drop into everybody's head while you're there? I drop into everyone's head pretty easily. I don't, you know, I don't find any of them more 
easier. Well, I don't find any of them more difficult than others, except for maybe Avery. I had to do some reading to get Avery just right mm -hmm. because I had to, normally I just go into an adult's head or, or like William or Nora or whatever. And I could sort of imagine what they would do and what they're thinking for Avery. I had to, um, because she's difficult and challenging, I had to read up on, on challenging children and how they behave and the kinds of things they might do. And, you know, what the experts might say and how the parents might try to parent her and how they might do it differently and, you know, have mm -hmm. all sorts of problems about that. So poor, poor Dr. Wooler thinks she just needs boundaries. Yes. So he tries to set boundaries and of course boundaries don't work with her. She's completely oppositional. So um, he's frustrated by that, uh, you know, understandably so. And the mother is more trying to be understanding of Avery and trying to just sort of, sort of shape her in a more gentle way. And figure, figure her out. Her. Yeah. And let's figure out, you know, what's going to yeah, do and, you know, like how we can help her and what we can do to guide her. But I, I love the fact that also that she got thrown out of choir practice. I mean, that was like the perfect thing. It's not like she's thrown out of like school for it's choir practice. And it's like, you were just not angelic at all. And I felt <laughs> it was just the perfect, perfect place for her to have gotten caught. It's not like she was at some sports or something like that. It's she's not singing on tune and she's not going to be behaving. So leave, no. you know, leave. She was disruptive. Yes, she was very disruptive. She she disruptive. Yeah. So I love how William twirled himself into a total mess. His mistress has already given him the boot. The wife's going to figure out what's going on. The daughter doesn't ever want to see him again. So I felt like badly things were going to go for him, like from the start. And it was like, no matter what William did, he was not getting himself out of the situation he was in. Am I right? Like you from the start said, we're just going to tour. I knew, I knew that he would be the start off suspect. And I knew that I would develop more suspects as I went along. I didn't know who they would be. Mm -hmm. I just knew that, um, he would be the prime suspect right off the bat. And I knew that they would have to look at the family. And I knew right from the beginning when I knew that there was a brother, I knew that they were going to talk to the brother about how things were in the family and that he would be put in that awkward spot of, you know, do I tell the truth? Right. Or do I hang my dad out? Do I hang, hang my dad out to dry kind of thing and tell them about the times he hit her or not? And, you know, it was just, it was fun for me to sort of, do all that but I, I knew William was going to have a hard time oh yeah I mean they call the office mm -hmm. where they, why weren't you there where were you why were you and then he's got these yeah. long explanations about what happened and where he was and what he did and and then there are there, there are just other things that happen later on with a dumpster I mean there's just so much interesting stuff. dumpster <laughs> dumpster was great the dumpster was great and when you read it, folks, you'll figure out why the dumpster was like super amusing in the book. So yeah, it was like, you know, right from there. Now, if I remember I think correctly- my favorite part was the whole dumpster thing. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. It's like, and you could just picture the dumpster. You could picture the dumpster yeah. behind that. The things people do. Yeah. Things they do. Now, if I remember correctly from another conversation, you don't outline in advance. No. You don't outline where no. you're going to go. When you get a really great idea, Okay, so say you're moving along and you get the dumpster idea, or you get this idea. Do you have to go back and rewrite to get yourself like more wrapped around that thing? Or you just, it's going to work. It's coming in at the right You know place. what? It Often with these things, they just appear and then they appear again. So, you know, without giving any spoilers away, I think the dumpster appears at some point and then it just naturally appears again later on. And I, and I, didn't know when it first appeared that it was going to appear in that way right at all but it does so I mean if I plant something earlier my mind just I think works on it and it shows up again somewhere else it starts to manifest like again later on yeah. like, okay what can I do yeah. with this you know blah 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 so you don't know yeah. the ending when you're going in you don't know that the ending no. is going to be no. wow and this has got such a great ending so once it does mm -hmm. come to you, like, does it come to you? Like, as you're writing, do you start writing towards it? Or is it really, you've got to wait till you get to those last couple of pages before you pull it together? No, it's not the last couple of pages. I'd say it's the last quarter or so. That's when I start to think about how am I going to, um, how am I going to bring this one to a conclusion? Right. And I have to say the ending on this one was really hard. And I think I changed it at least twice until I was happy. Like I knew I knew something was going to happen in the middle and I can't say what it was, but I, but I knew that, but I didn't know what was going to happen the second half of the book or how it was going to end. Mm -hmm. And when I got towards the end, I knew the kind of 
resolution that I wanted, but I didn't know how I would present it. Like I didn't know mm -hmm. how it would happen, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I actually rewrote that two or three different times to have the reveal it, it, it come out in a different way. But the final one with the journalist, I thought that was a good way oh. to do it. I was, I was happy with that, but yeah, that was about my third try on the ending. But it's a really ter terrific twist at the end. I mean, it's really terrific. And okay, mm -hmm. I know that Hank Philippi Ryan interviewed you, and I know Hank reads the last page of a book before she uh, starts she? every book. She reads the last page of the book because she wants to know how it's going to end. And I'm telling but everybody, she yes, she does. She, she, she she'll told me that. She'll freely admit it. If you ask her, she'll freely admit. She goes, oh, oh yeah, I was. Okay. Just, I don't want to. I, I just want to know, like, you know, how it's going to come together at the end. And I'm always so shocked as a thriller writer that she reads the last page. And I've asked her about this. Yeah. On multiple occasions. Yeah. I want to tell everybody, do not read the last pages of this book. You have to get, no. you have to get there. And when you get there, it's going to be so satisfying, but don't cheat yourself because all you're going to do yeah. is cheat yourself out of a very satisfying ending. So. Mm -hmm. I would never read the last page. Oh, she, she um, I've, I've heard something else that some people skip the prologue which shocked me right. i would never skip the prologue you've heard this I, too no i've heard it too and you prologue. know what i often do is i often tell people to go back and read the prologue at the end to go back mm -hmm. and see because sometimes it makes no sense to you at the beginning you're reading a prologue yeah. and you're not like well why is this there and i don't understand yeah. but at the end it's going to go, it's going to crystallize for you. So go back and look at it later on and see like, you know, did the prologue, sh uh, did, did it hold up for you? Did it work? Did yeah. all that kinds of things yeah. happen? I always read the prologue again yeah. too. Yeah. And you had your credits to people up front. You had your thank yous up front in the book. I was Yeah. Reading. Yeah. Which yeah. I think is lovely. I think it's really, really lovely because a lot of people don't get to the end and read those. Yeah, and yet my, those were a lot of people working with you. Yeah. Yeah, my publisher did that. And I, I like it having it there. It's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's and, more likely that people will read it. Well, here's a question. So that thinking of that, when you finish your like the draft you think you're really good, who does it go to? Does it go to your agent? Does it go to your editor? Who gets the work at that point to take a look and give thoughts? So when I've finished a first draft that I'm happy with as a first draft, knowing that it still needs a ton of work. I give it to my agent and my U.S. editor and my British editor all at the same time. Okay. And then they all yeah. give you comments. Do they get together on their comments or do you get three separate decks of comments? Um, I get, well, my, my, my agent will tell me what she thinks. And then the two editors will combine notes okay. and tell me what they think. Gotcha. And then I have to do a ton of work. <laughs> and then it's like, Usually oh. I have to do it a ton of work. Yeah. Yeah. But if it's at if that stage, it's, the good time to get input too, because sometimes if you get the input later, like, oh, yeah. wait a second, whoa, 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 that's going to be a lot more rewriting than if you're saying, okay, mm -hmm. this now take it here. Okay, I see what's going on. But this one just feels yeah. like it's the the perfect kind of thriller. It truly does, because the ending is like spot on. So this is the seventh thriller you've done. Is this, have you changed anything the way you write? Is it, do you find the first draft is faster? Do you find that the changes or the editor's notes are easier to deal with or it's still the same? I don't find any of it e easier or different, to be quite honest. I find every book really hard work. Mm -hmm. um, I find it still, you know, I still do the first draft in four or five months. I still do the edits for another four or five months. I have not found the drafts easier. I have not, not found the edits easier. I haven't found anything about it easier. <laughs> <laughs> um, I you know I I know it's it's hard, and I actually think I'm finding it harder to come up with interesting ideas because now I've sort of I've done a missing child, I've done a stolen baby, I've done you know I've did a husband kill his first wife. I mean, it's getting harder I think to come up with, and and as more and more of these books are written, and there, right. you know there's so many interesting ones with interesting angles to them, I think oh well I can't do that because so and so just did it brilliantly. So mm. I'm actually finding it a little bit harder to come up with the idea and then the book is just as hard to write as ever I'm sorry to tell you this but every, every writer I know says the same thing it just doesn't get easier and I will think that right now there's a lot out there are a lot of books out yes. and there's a lot out in the genre so and there, yes. there are these books that are brisk reading but are they completely delivering and some I'm, some I have this summer have read have delivered others I haven't been there's something that's what's 
touch me not right along the way or da da da. And I sit and I really sit and evaluate like what's going to be a bets on mm-hmm. at the end. I really pull myself yeah. back. In fact, yesterday I was thinking about a couple of books and I said, you know what? I'm going to pull up. We do a, um, a book of Chino live every month where we talk to readers about 225 readers mm-hmm. come every month and we preview books to them. And at the end we put my bets on up and I said, let's pull up that slide and see if the books I'm thinking about like work with the others that I've got. And some didn't. And we just said, okay, Paul, and that's it. Because okay. it's like, I'm holding it up, up against the others that I've put up there. And are, do mm-hmm. I think it's going to work just as well? Or the people are going to be just captivated right from the beginning. And I, it, it, it is more difficult because there's a lot out in the genre, but not everything is um, really good. It's really good. It's not. Really yeah. I, I have to agree with you. And, and, yeah. You know, I would never name any names, but yeah. I think there are an awful lot of books out there, an awful lot of domestic suspense. And I don't think I don't think all of them are no. top tier. No. Um, and I think I think in, in a way it's a shame because there's there's just so much out there. And it's hard for people to find books in a way. Um, oh, it's yes. hard. It, it yeah, is. yeah, it's hard to select. It's hard to select. They're easy to find, but it's hard to choose what you're going to spend your time on you know so yeah I think it is and I also think that even the number of people who do not ever look at the New York Times list though it's given such high Mm -hmm. like you know pressure in our business like are you on for one week you're on for two weeks you know da 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 it's given the number of people that I will go out with that tell me they read a lot and say is lessons in chemistry a good book totally floors me the number of people yeah. that I hear going when I go out and I hear what they're reading and it is nowhere near what came out this week, last week, a month ago. And it constantly surprises me. I think that like, you know, during the pandemic, we didn't have people going to libraries and they didn't, weren't going to bookstores. And that's the reason we started doing Bookachino Live. In fact, we're yeah. doing an evening an event in September so the, because we had a ton of people who can't come during the day that wanted to come to this. And I just find that with people not going to the library, not going to bookstore, they weren't seeing the books that were out there. And if people are still doing ebooks or they're still getting audio from the library or they're just doing a quick download of something they hear, they're not seeing everything that's out there right now. And I think that's one thing that's going on a big way. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, we in the business and in the industry, of course, we look at the New York Times bestseller list, but you know, most people I know don't get the New York Times. I'm in Canada and they don't bother to look it up online. So people, people aren't aware of what's the New York Times bestseller list unless you tell them and that's not necessarily how they choose books Mm -mm. um so yeah and then i don't know it's there are moments that they're thinking i have issues with goodreads i have issues with people giving away the whole plot of the book i have issues that's terrible yeah the the whole plot i mean there are times where i'm trying to remember what a book is about and i'll just go out there because someone has written the entire synopsis out there of the book the whole thing is going to be there just go out and read it folks and I have trouble with read. the way people rate things. I have the trouble with considering that those ratings carry in so much of what's going to happen with advertising, marketing, whatever, of how the book is mm-hmm. being perceived out there. Yeah. And I'm there like, I want to know more about you who are doing that. How old are you? What else have you read? Like, I want to know more about you, your background, where you live, all those kinds of things in order for me mm-hmm. to evaluate if you're going to be interested in the same kind of book I'm going to be interested in. And yeah. What were you taking this book down about? Like, what was it that you, you know, and, or what were you praising that like totally missed me? So I find, yeah. I find that a lot of this stuff of it got five stars, any place. I mean, any place at all is not exactly to me, the, the bar, the barometer that I'm looking for. And I think that, I mean, a lot of people say they follow what we do on book reporter because we really, we, first of all, I never bash books. I mean, I have zero time. There, there was a book a couple of weeks ago that I, I didn't enjoy, the reviewer didn't enjoy. I said, then just skip it. Like, let's let's not do this. I do not need yes. to sit there and tell America what not to read. That's not my job. My job is to sit there yeah. and say, let's get people interested in authors and books. And right from the beginning, it was about interviewing authors because by understanding the author, picture this is 1995, 96 on AOL, where we're typing what the author thinks because- <laughs> There is none of the broadband stuff, but it was trying to bring the author to, because all you knew was, you know, she lives in, in Canada, da, 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 da. She has a dog. She has a child. That's all you'd know about the author. There was nothing else. Mm -hmm. So now every author has got to be a personality. You've got to be everywhere, you know? Yeah. 
it's a lot of uh, it puts a lot of pressure on the writer to yes. use a lot of time that they didn't used to use out there on social media and so on. So the the writer's job is much more demanding time wise than it mm-hmm. ever used to be, and I think it gets more so all the time. Mm-hmm. So you know, there's events, there's social media, there's, there's all kinds of promotion that needs to be done that they didn't do 20, 30, 40 years ago. No. Um, and that cuts into your writing time and your revision time and so on. I mean, it's good because it gets your book out there in front of people, but it also gets everyone else's book out there in front of people. Right. So we're all in the same place. We're just busier. But it, it's also who can do it the best, <clears throat> who can do the promotion yes. of our, that have the best. Look, we're doing the same yeah. thing because we started really realizing on Instagram, we should be talking about the reviews we're doing this week. We should be talking about what we picked as the bets on. We should be start doing this stuff, tagging the authors, tagging the publishers, all this kind of stuff. And it's like every Sunday night, a lot of people don't know, I send out all the reviews to the publishers. I say, this is what happened on the site this week. I usually try to do it on Sunday night, sit on the couch, da, da, da. So at the beginning of the week, that's done bad when it's happened on Thursday. That means it was a bad week. But usually, but you're trying constantly to get, this is what's happening. This is what we want to do. This is the kind of authors we're covering, et cetera, out to people. Mm -hmm. So I feel everybody on their own level are out talking about what they're doing. And then you have readers out talking about the books as well. So it's Mm -hmm. this constant book conversation, but we're still trying to reach people. If that, if that makes sense, you know? So let's go with the title. Was it always everyone here is lying? Because everyone certainly was. I'm sure I just left the light on it. Was this always the title? Yeah, we only found it right at the very end. And it was my British editor, uh, Sarah Adams, that came up with it. Because we struggled for months to think of a good title. Titles are very difficult because they have to be thrillery. Yes. And they, they have to suit the book. But so many of them are taken. Like you think of a good title, and you go, oh, that's a great title. And then you Google it and there's like another book with the same title. It happens all the time. Yep. And I can't believe that nobody nobody has used that one yet. And yeah. then Lisa Jewell came out with none of this is true at the same time. It was very yeah. close. And I thought, whew, same, t- same sentiment, but different titles. But yeah, it's really hard to get a good title. Really hard. And, so. and for people to say, this is the one we're talking about, everyone here, it's not the other one because it sounds similar. You know, it's like all that kind yeah. of stuff as well. Um, how about the cover is terrific. Did you have a hand in this? Because we've got the, we've got the, uh, what's it called? The treehouse and the treehouse the- swing. No, yeah. I mean, I have, I'm very lucky. I have really, really good designers in uh, both in the US, for US and Canada that have this thing. And then in the UK, and they always have different covers. Right. Always very different markets. They go for very different uh, covers. This is the American cover, of course, or the American and Canadian. And I love it. It's got this treehouse with the swing. Yeah. And it's just so creepy. It's kind of creepy. And, of course, there is a treehouse with a swing. And it's important. Yeah. Um, so I, I love it. I mean, the other one, the British cover is different. It's a neighborhood from top down. And it's looking quite spookily at the neighborhood right. but uh, this one is a bit different yeah and I like a it bit of a departure from the house with the light on I feel like this is like it's the gloaming and the lighting. Of the night it's the time of night where if you're uh, lost if you're the child and you're lost this is the scary time because nobody yeah. may find you like this is the time where you know night is coming I felt like looking at this yeah and if she's and that's gonna, pretty much when she disappeared too yeah like she's scared later. this yeah. is like you know this yeah. is like you know what's going on so yeah. I like it how about and they the, always Let's do great colors, great yes. colors, and all the books look good together. They have these bright colors, and I got yeah. to wear a purple shirt today. I was like very excited. I got to like blend in with the cover. <laughs> I was like, I was trying to dress to match the cover. I go in the other room and I've got like you know shirts and all different <laughs> colors. It's very funny, but I feel like I don't want to distract from the cover. So, how about the audio? January Leboy <laughs> is the narrator for the audio book. Did you have a chance to listen to her yet? You know what? I haven't. I've been doing so much promotion. I'm trying to get the edits done on the the next book. In fact, I haven't received it yet, the audio, but I will tell you, I have had more praise for January Lavoy than I've ever heard in my life. Like normally no one talks to me about the narrator, but I've had people, I was in Boston. Was it Boston or, or Pittsburgh? And people were saying, we love January Lavoy. Her, she's fantastic. And <laughs> I've had so much on Instagram going, I love this. So this audio apparently is, people love it. They oh, love her. So I've that's said, I want her to do all my books. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, but no, I haven't listened to it. 
because I was, I looked and she hasn't done yours in the past because I went to look and say, I was Never, oh, she no. got the voice of you, you know, da, 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 da. So but, I'm going to- But, sh- you know, I want her from now on because everybody <laughs> That's exactly. loves her. Book her now. So I'm going to share with readers mm-hmm. that once you finish Everyone Here is Lying, if you've never read your books before, I think they start with the couple next door. What do you think? If there's somebody who hasn't read you before, where do they go? Start there. It, it doesn't matter because they're all standalones. Um, they can all be read in any kind of order. But I would probably start with Couple Next Door unless you're tired of disappearing children stories, in which <laughs> case you might want to start with something different. But they're all, all twisty mysteries and they don't connect. So, yeah. No, no, they, they don't. With anything really. No, last time it was like, you know, the, yeah. the, everybody with the money, who's going to get the money? You know, it's like all these kinds of things, they work. You know? Yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. Yeah. So what's next for you? What are you working on? Are you on revisions on the next book? Where are you up to? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing the, the last bit of editing on the next book, which is coming out next July. Wow. Um, and I can't give you a title yet, although we do have a, a good title for it. This hasn't been announced yet. But it's set in rural Vermont, and it's a little bit different. It's it's also a twisty, um, what really happened here thing. Um, but it's a little bit of a different vibe. Um, it's it's fast paced. It's a little bit of a departure for me. So we'll see. It's been it's been fun until now, and now I'm sick of it. <laughs> Now give me you, know, plot. you work so hard on something for a year and you're like oh I'm so sick of this I just want to be done <laughs> yeah yeah it's like okay wait oh did I really write that yes okay fine I think I have to keep it you know it's a and we're at yeah. like the last edit kind of a thing and I'm like oh can I change this no you can't just go and I'm like all right just take it away take it away you know yeah, yeah. That's, that's me revising a newsletter on a Friday night. Do I like this? And I always call the editorial director and go, does this work? Like, does this sound good? Because you're at the point where you've just overthought everything so much that is this exactly. really going to work? Is it is, And it's even just me writing like a newsletter opener kind of thing. I said, is that funny? Is it going to like, is that really true? Or am I just finding this amusing? And it's like, no, okay, you can get away with this. Don't worry about it. But like sometimes yeah. you start to question yourself after you've done it, like, you know, 15 times. And then yeah, also because you look at it and you play. Yeah. yeah. In, in talking about it, you can't give so anything. Yeah, you can comment. imagine. <laughs> no, exactly. exactly. That makes it harder to write, doesn't it? Yeah. It makes it harder yeah. for me to talk about it because it's like, okay, we can't yeah. talk about this. We can't talk about that, which is the reason sometimes we do our Book of Chino Live book club. And by then you have to have read the book. We wait till the book's out in paperback. Oh, yeah. And then that we makes bring it people so in. So much more fun to talk about. And then you could sit there and talk about anything that's in the book. And I remember we had right. the Paper Palace and we actually had a vote with people of what they thought happened at the end. And she was blown away because she really thought that everybody knew the ending of the book. She's like, did you really not see it? And, I, and it's like, reread the last three pages. It was so funny, but people were out there voting going, no, that's not the way it ended. It was great. You know, you know it's so, sometimes that was me. People will say, well, what happened? You know, what what really <laughs> happened at the end? And I always I always answer that question at the end. I, I think it's pretty clear what happened. Yes. But some people don't get it. And they think, well, you know, is this what happened? I go, yeah, I, I think it's pretty clear that's what happened. <laughs> yeah. um, I have questions about not a happy family. Well, what what happened at the end, you know, are they going to get caught? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> <He's> like, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it's not going to yeah. go well, it's not going to go well no. for what they all did. No, yeah. yeah. No, but it, it, but sometimes you have to sit there, but we literally had people voting and say, how would you vote? And it was like 50, 50. And we were like, whoa, this, and I read the book with my book club too. And at the end I said, okay, what do you think happened? And I think there were like, maybe there were 12 of us sitting there, eight thought one thing, three thought another, and then one thought something else. And I was like, really? And I said, can we wow. read the last three pages aloud and see if we get the answer? And it was, I thought it was pretty clear, but it was still, and I'm not so saying actually, about my book club. I'm not saying about, it, yeah. it, literally, this is what has happened with this book. But, did she but go I, with her I, lover or did she stay? Those are the questions. Did she go with her lover or did she stay? And after you reread it together, was this still... You then know, they got it a little still... bit more. Then they got it. Oh, little... Okay. Yeah, but it okay. was we really took careful reading of those last three. I said, just think about what they're saying, right? What she's saying right here. Think about what yeah. She's Sometimes I think, or I worry with my books because they're fast paced and people read them too quickly. Mm-hmm. And I think if you read them too quickly, you can miss stuff. Oh yeah, you miss like yeah. 
Yep. So I think, you know, one of the one of the problems with writing page turners is that I think some of the subtleties that I enjoy writing that are there right. get missed by some people. Oh, but then there's so many that just say, oh, that's so good. But I will tell people that at the end of the chapter, you do, and we talked about this in our last interview, you you do write it so that you want to turn that page. You want to turn that page and you want to keep going because wait, what's going on here? Got to keep going. So I literally told your publisher that I needed a copy of the book and I was reserving a day to read the book. And I literally stood in the pool reading the book with the pool on the side. And it was better than the week, the week after where I took the book and I dropped the book in the pool, which made, see, this is a hardcover. Usually I get galleys so I can drop them in the pool. This, like I had to be very careful and stand on the side, but you know, and people come out and they go, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm reading. I'm just sitting with my book. Like, can't you figure that out? That's what I'm doing. <laughs> but I, I call you the one sit read. I think that I'm coining that name for you because, and I've told it to more people and like I said, our contest coordinator, Lisa Hickman, said I couldn't put the book down. She said, that was a really good book. And, you know, I love it when people haven't read you before and they feel that feeling and they're like, oh, wait, there's six other books to go read. That's good. Yeah, it's lovely when someone discovers your, your backlist. And, you know, that's my favorite thing to hear that I couldn't put it down. And I that's the thing I probably hear more than anything else mm -hmm. that I couldn't put it down, which and is great because that's what I want. Mm hmm. And I always feel a little bit guilty, but I'm glad you feel good about it because it took you how long to write it and it took me a day to read it. But by the same token, it's the completely satisfying thing of the way it was written, it completely delivered. And I think that's mm -hmm. that's what the author's looking for. You yeah, know, regardless. I mean, it takes me seven. takes me a year to, to write it. And if you read it in a day, that's okay. <laughs> but I've got to keep writing another one. So yeah. I've got to come up with another idea for the next one. Well, here it is, folks. If you read this in a day, you need to make sure someone else reads it as well. You've got to get somebody else to go out and buy the book. And that's your job. That If you read it that quickly, your job is to say, this book is so good. You need to go read it too. And don't give them and your you copy. Because you're going to want your copy to hold on to because you're going to want to remember that you read this book that well. So that's my feeling. Let's see if our readers take it from there. I, meanwhile, I've got my chocolate chips. I look forward to you refilling yours and I look forward to seeing what you write next. You know, there you go. I'm going to refill my tippets because I still have line edits to do today. <laughs> there you go. Back to your line. Oh, edit. the new book. Maybe we'll discuss next year. And I'll say, remember, remember when we talked and I was feeling like, oh, am I ever going to get this book done? And you'll say, I just read that book. I just that'll read make me feel good. <laughs> I'll be I just read that because every year I go through this at the end and I'm going, oh, just going to finish, just going to finish. And then I just have to start a new one. Oh, I mean, I wrote Ben and I was like, Ben, uh, where's the book? I need to be reading this book so I can talk about it, Ben. Let's get the book out. You know, so it's like, yeah. really, yeah. It's, I'm always excited when to see your book's coming. And I'm always excited because when I do our preview events, I know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about one of your books. And it's like, you know, that's really like the most fun part. It's going to be this neighborhood story. You're going to be looking at your neighborhood a little bit differently. And I've really been joking with people on the block now about like, what do I know? Oh, the little black car is in the driveway. Is the white car there too? What do I know? And you don't know that much. <laughs> you think you know more. No, than no. I, I, I have learned that I'm absolutely a terrible witness. I couldn't tell you because, you know, people come and say, do you know who owns that car? This is back when I lived in the city and people need a car moved for something to do some renos. Mm -hmm. And they're going, well, do you know who owns that car? And I have no idea. <laughs> and, you know, and I've lived there for years. I don't remember who's got what. I, I'm terrible. Right. I, right. I, yeah. Know, it, I just don't notice things. No. And you think you notice yeah. more. Like I, my son even says to me, he goes, don't you see my car in the driveway? I said, from the angle I'm sitting, no, I don't see it. I'd have to lean and do this. And I'm not going to do that because I'll say, are you home? And he goes, don't you see my car in the driveway from where you are? I'm like, no, I don't. You know, these are the things <laughs> not gotten across to me. And then, you know, it, it, they'll say somebody got a new car and I'm like, who, where, you know, and we still all don't know each other on our block. I mean, because people have moved in, people have moved out. Yeah. And one of my neighbors was telling us that she had a conversation with somebody the other day and she said, I didn't meet her. She was across the street and she came over to ask me a question. And it was just really funny because like, I don't know her either. Three doors away, but it's mm -hmm. suburbs, you know, it's got, yeah. there's lots of intrigue when you're talking about the suburbs, you know? <laughs> well, look at that guy who, the serial killer in yes. Long Island. Yes. Yes. I mean, sure, his house was run down, but he went to work every day with a briefcase. I mean, I shuddered when I heard that. I thought, yeah, 
he went to work. I mean, you think it can't happen, but all the, that whole neighborhood is like, I know they're saying, how about the vault of guns that were down there? And then the family is suing the police department because the house is in such disrepair. Now, if you Google the story, it's like wild because the whole house was ripped apart. They took out the drains in the house because they were trying to look for like, you know, blood or whatever they were looking for that could be there. So these people got back and they were showing pictures of the whole thing. Like picture every box in your house has been kind of ransacked and gone through. It's not like they're going through carefully of let's just see. It's like, well, they can't, if if they need to pull up the drains and the, you know, dig it but no one's going to want to ever live in that house anyway. They're going to have to rip it down. It it was just, yeah. I mean, and to think about, and so then Bob Colker had written a book about this years ago. I can't remember the title right now. And it became a Netflix series. So there's been so much talk about these murders and what was going on. And he wrote a piece for the Times about it. And it's just, this happened like right here. And now they're looking at all the other places this man has been. And like, okay, he went down to South Carolina, who's dead down there. They went down to get the truck to see if there are any fibers still in the truck from any of these women. So when you, it, okay, the way that tracking is done these days is very different than what it was done 10, 15, 20 years ago. So if you're an author, you've got to know that these are the kinds of things, if you're a police officer, you're going to go in and go look yeah. at, you're going to rip the house apart. And somebody's going to be saying yeah. later, why did you rip my house apart? Because that's the way it's done. So yeah. That And how about the guy in Moscow, Idaho? That they found the, um, I don't know if you followed this one, were four people killed. Oh, in, in the dormitory. The it, yep. And yeah. they were actually in their apartment building. And the way they tracked him and his DNA to the garbage at his parents' house in Pennsylvania, and that's where they arrested him, because the DNA on the garbage matched the DNA that they had on something else back in Idaho. I think it was on the, the knife or something like that. The DNA yeah. could match that was his father and- and then they went in with like, you know, the, the FBI goes in with like the the, the, the um, battering ram to go into the house in the middle of the night. You just picture being the parents and it's like, boom, we're coming in and we're getting your son for these murders that you heard about in Idaho. And you Those heard about parents and the parents are. And actually, if you look, he's stopped twice. He drives cross country with his father. OK, his father flies out to meet him and they drive cross country and he stopped twice for tailgating. And they have the dash cams of these conversations. I go, yeah, he was out and I don't get where those murders were. Like the father is saying this and he's sitting next to his son who right now, I mean, he's still not found guilty. I mean, he's the suspect in these murders, Mm -hmm. but it's crazy when you sit and watch the whole line of evidence of what they were going for and how at the beginning now, if crime happens, we expect the police to have the answer that night, like, because there's all this available and it's interesting to see what they have to withheld from the public because yeah. we've got all our amateur sleuths out there, which you have to be better than too, is everybody who's sitting mm-hmm. in the national park trying to find the girl that was with the guy in the van. You know, where's that body? And we're going to go. You know, it's like that don't fuck with the cats on the internet show. I mean, and it's, you, you make a point. I mean, it's, it's getting harder and harder to be an author now. It there's, is. There's all this stuff you have to know. And yeah, it's, and it's DNA tricky. matters so much because so many yeah. crimes are being because they found the DNA in some locker someplace and they're bringing it out and going. Now that's how they found the Golden State um, killer, and you know that, that's how they found that person. And so it is harder for an author right now because you've yeah. got to know all these tools that are available, or you have to set it back ten years, or you've got to set it back. Yeah. Years to do yeah, it. Yeah, but now they're also doing all that reverse DNA engineering or that yeah. reverse. DNA where they find the family member and they're catching a lot of people that way. So that's kind right. of fun. Yeah. That's yeah. Fun. It, it's like all these kinds of things you can just have fun with, but it's um, if you set it in 1999, you don't have to worry about a cell phone. If you sell it in 2009, you don't have an iPhone and it's just all these yeah. things that happen. Along and that would make it, that would make it easier, but then I can't remember what kind of clothes people were in 2000. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's, right. It's right they get you either way there's research that has to be done either way right and like did avery have a cell phone she's nine she could have had a cell phone and then yeah but she's right on the cusp parents aren't letting her have a cell phone yet i thought about that but then you can track somebody a lot easier if you've got that and you they're all these well you always have to remember that you know they turn the cell phone off or they left the cell phone at home like the easiest thing is just to leave the cell phone at home and then it looks like you're at home right but you can't forget 
forget about that. If you do, all the readers will write in and say, well, he would have had his phone with him automatically and they would know where he was at such and such a time. So yeah. you got to be so careful. He's got to leave the it. The readers are very clever. The yeah. readers of crime are very clever these days. And it's gotten more so. sophisticated out there. So, mm-hmm. well, I'll leave yeah. you with your revisions. I'll be ready to book my date for next July. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to okay. leave. Okay, and I'll be at Thriller Fest next summer. So hopefully I'll I, see you there. I will hopefully see you there. Definitely, I will come by just to sit yeah. and have conversation with you. Because I remember we've only had those conversations okay. on the fly at Thriller Fest. We've never really sat down. So next year, we're going to make a yeah. date. We're going to make a date. We're going to have a drink or something and chat. I'll be there. Okay. So yeah. looking forward I'll to that. There. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Okay. And, and I'll be to, working on a different set of revisions. <laughs> and All to, right. We look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks to where I hope we won't have to revise anything. Okay. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Bye now. <laughs>